I think I can mention three or four differences. First, we played our games in 20-minute halves. There wasn't any dribbling. The footwork at that time wasn't perfected like it is now. We played a four-man offense and a four-man defense. We played what we call a floating center. We had a back guard, a man who never passed the center of the floor except to intercept the ball. You don't always find a good combination. I mean, some of them are good at baskets, and some of them are good at guards, and, and uh, you have to pick them out to fit your team. We went in New Albany to play a basketball game, and uh, New Albany beat us, I think, eight points. But I think it was maybe 18 to 10 or something like that. And um, I thought New Albany's the best team we'd ever heard of, ever seen. And the next week, they went to Evansville to play in the regional. When they got in the regional, they uh, got beat 50 to 10. And we thought they were good. One of the schools we didn't didn't have a, an out of bounds on the one end and the players could climb that wall and throw the ball down through the basket. And we went to another place where one side of the gymnasium was a wall, no out of bounds, and half of it was chicken wire. And the players on that home team would throw the ball against the wall and run down on the other side and pick it off and go on and score the basket. And these small cities would build gyms to seat five and six thousand people, more people than there were in the cities. Uh, Dr. Naismith, the inventor of the game of basketball, uh, attended the Indiana State Tournament. Frankfurt was the state championship in 25. At that year, uh, the state championship was played in the old cow barn, the exposition building out at state fairgrounds. That was before it's going to Butler. And Dr. Naismith, uh, according to my research, uh, gave the 1925 champion Frankfurt team their awards. We went to the final game of the, of the state tournament all three years. Uh, my sophomore, years we, uh, sophomore year, we lost the championship game. My junior year, we won the championship game. My senior year, we lost again. He is a great person. He's, he's good for basketball. and uh, he's, uh, Johnny was a, was a good player. and. Uh, well, he's an All-American. I think he scored five points in the state finals. But I'd started the practice of looking back at my wife uh, when I was a player uh, in, in, in uh, high school and when she, play, she played in the band. And uh, from that time, and she'd always do this, and I'd give her a wink or smile. And that helpful. That, that, gave me, that gave me something. I missed her when she wasn't there. Looking at Glenn Curtis, I simply couldn't understand his success at first. He was so quiet, so reserved. But you put him on the bench and he became a dynamo. I think that's the way with a lot of our coaches. In the early years of Indiana basketball, Glenn Curtis had to be the number one uh, coach uh, throughout the state. I was broadcasting a sectional down in Terre Haute. And in that sectional, there was a high school by the name of P-I-M-E-N-T-O. And of course, I pronounce it just the same way as you would, as Pimento. And all during that tournament, I called it Pomato. And when I got back to the studio, the telephones were breaking off the wall. I'd pronounced it wrong. It was Pimento. There's five seconds left in the, in the ball game. And uh, Muncie has the ball. And I'm guarding a, a fellow by the name of Jack Mann, who is six foot seven. He gets around me, goes to the basket for a layup, and he misses it. And I get the rebound, throw the ball out to the center of the court to Billy Thoman. Billy immediately turns and, and, and shoots at the basket. The gun goes off. And the thing went in. And we're ahead by one point. Well, at that point, pandemonium breaks loose in this field house of 7,000 people. Because one of the officials has indicated that the ball was not in the air at the time, and the other one indicated that the ball was in the air and that the basket counted. This ball game had occurred at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At 5.30, they announced that we had officially won the ball game. However, they had to call the commissioner in Indianapolis, and he came from Indianapolis to Muncie 
and discussed the circumstances with the two officials, and they finally decided that we had won the ball game. Buttermilk sky, I'm keeping my eye peeled on you. What's the good word tonight? Are you gonna be mellow tonight? Oh, buttermilk sky, can't you see my little donkey and me? Oh, we're as happy as the Christmas tree, heading for the one I love. I'm gonna pop her the question, that question. Do you, darling, do you do? It'll be easy, so easy. If I can only bank on you, oh, buttermilk sky, I'm telling you why, now you know, keep it in mind tonight, keep a brush of those clouds from sight, oh, buttermilk sky, don't you feel me when I'm needing you most, hang a moon above her hitching post, hitch me to the one I love, you can if you try, but don't you tell me no lie. Oh, will you be mellow and bright tonight, oh, buttermilk sky? Can't if you try, but don't you tell me no lie. Oh, will you be mellow and bright tonight, oh, buttermilk sky? Mr. Case had us in the dressing room, and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to win it next year. That's all he said. And so we practiced all through that summer, and finally, uh, well, we did win the state championship. In the late 30s, Anderson was one of the powers in the state. And we'd always have a team, and like, boy, this team is going to go to the state. It's going to win the state. And Anderson would come down here and beat it, and it got to be very frustrating. It's 34 to 32 for Fort Wayne. Ralph passes it to Hines, Hines to Glass, Glass back up to Bellier, and Fort Wayne holds that last, and there's a ball game. Fort Wayne is the state <laughs> I was told at halftime at the final game in 1939 by Mr. Trester himself that I won the Agimbo Award. And he says, now you go back and you sit there and don't tell a soul. So I'm sitting with my buddies there, and I have this secret, and I, it's the longest half I'd ever gone through because I couldn't tell anybody that I was going to win the Gimbal Award when the game was over. I uh, started shooting a one-handed hook shot back in the days when all uh, high school ball players were shooting two-handed. In my day, like in 1944, we took our time, we set up everything, we uh, tried to get our best shooter in the best spot, and uh, uh, where, whenever possible, we had a, we always worked for the real good shot, but we were doing it slowly instead of in a big hurry. We won the state championship in 44. We really wasn't supposed to win it that year, and we, we did, and of course, after we won that, why we came back the next year and uh, and won it again. The Mammoth Butler Fieldhouse in Indianapolis is the scene of the 1946 Indiana High School basketball finals. There had been some before. Back in the uh, early 30s, uh, Muncie was a very integrated school. So was uh, so was Anderson. And uh, but uh, then it was a sort of a low period to the middle 30s, late 30s, and then in uh, Fort Wayne. Uh, came up in about 42, they had, I think, two or three blacks on the team. And then and when we came in in 46, uh, that was really the start of uh, what is going on today. Actually, in Anderson, it was not a big deal because uh, we were just a bunch of guys playing basketball for a, a coach that, uh, who originally was from Missouri that uh, we thought when he came in would, be, would make a difference. But uh, he turned out to be the finest individual I ever met in my life. And, we just played ball as ball players, and there was no uh, indication of black, white, or whatever. The Board of Control and Officers of the Indiana High School Athletic Association not only promotes all sports, but organizes the state basketball tournament, which now moves into its championship round. In this 43rd annual championship game, the Anderson team is wearing the dark uniforms and Fort Wayne the white. Anderson, a state champion in 1935 and again in 1937, is coached by Charles L. Cummings. Fort Wayne team, coached by Murray Mendenhall, were champions in 1943, and tonight they're playing hard for another championship. 
Johnny Wilson, Anderson Center, sets a new championship game scoring record of 30 points. Anderson leads at halftime 36 to 24. The 15,000 tickets sold for this championship game sets an all-time record and boosts the total number of tournament tickets sold to over one and a quarter million. The final gun, Anderson wins 67 to 53. Anderson and Coach Cummings celebrate the big moment. The 1946 state tournament goes into the record books as one of the greatest of all time. Everybody loved uh, to play basketball. They, everybody got along well. And it was a team that was just gelling. And when we came out of the Wabash Valley Tournament uh, undefeated at that point, we said we, we think that we could go all the way with a few breaks. And I think that going all the way, you have to have the breaks as you go. And uh, we won 30 straight ball games and came coming into the uh, semifinal against Marion. Uh, that was our 31st uh, straight win. And we'd have been the only team in the state of Indiana at that time that had, would have gone undefeated and to win the championship of, um, of the state. And we figured that we could win the, the state and go all the way and undefeated. Yes, it's a good day for singing a song And it's a good, good day for moving along Yes, it's a good day, how could anything go wrong? It's a good day from morning till night Yes, it's a good day for shining your shoes And it's a good day for losing the blues Everything to gain and nothing to lose Cause it's a good day from morning till night I said to the sun, good morning sun I'm rise and shine today Cause it's a good, good day for paying your bills And it's a good, good day for curing your ills So take a deep breath and throw away your pills Cause it's a good day from morning till night defeated a fine Vincennes team, and we had three big wins right at the season, climax of the season. Well, we went into the tournament, and we weren't respected even then, and I think uh, we weren't the target. Uh, all those schools did like to uh, like to beat Jasper because we were had been in the Summer State a great number of times. Every garage had a basketball hoop. Uh, the fathers had probably played, so uh, when you were a little kid, uh, you, your dad had been a high school player in that town, and he wanted you to to get uh, proficient enough in basketball so that you could play uh, for your high school team. When I was in grade school, and uh, I had set my mind to that, I said, one day, maybe I'll be able to play in the high school tournament. Thank you. 
Uh, the two guards that could go eventually were picked as the number one or number two guard in the state and that helps to have somebody around like that and I had three front line men and we played basketball and they were a great bunch of kids to work with and they did exactly what I said losing the game probably is one of the biggest disappointments in my life still being there I, I realize now more than I did at that time so after we had lost the game uh, I realize now how important and how lucky we were to, to be in the championship game. Let me say this, you have to go through it to, to really have the feeling it exists there after something like that happens. I was very happy for the kids. I've always been happy for my kids. And uh, they deserved to win. It was a lot of them second championship. And uh, well, it, I, I can't explain it. You have to experience it before you express the feeling. There were two twins at Gersmeyer High School in Terre Haute. One was named Harley and the other was named Arley. Harley and Arley Andrews. Now, they went to state finals about two or three years in a row in the 50s. But one of the other players on the team was their uncle. So they called, and his name was Harold. And so they called him Arley, Harley, and Uncle Harold. Well, this high school coach that I told you about, Howard Sharp, he had a funny kind of thing. Being that they were twins, he had one of them wear number 34 and one wear number 43. Just the numbers backwards. Well, it backfired on him because at the state tournament, they got something mixed up there, and they called a foul on the wrong twin, and the best player fouled out of the ball game, and they lost in the state high school tournament. It's anybody's ball game yet, folks. One minute and eight seconds to go, 42 to 41 Central, with Central up with two throws. There's a lot of pressure on these two throws. Now, Tony, let's see if Paul Harvey spreads the needle. And he missed uh, the first one. Look at him. That's tough strain for a boy, but it's... Boy, you got to have the old ice water at a time like this. The second one, no good. The rebound goes they got to the Wilson. ball while oh, they were fortunate there. A minute and two seconds. You watch the ball game. I'll watch the clock. 58 seconds. 57. 56. 55. 54. 53. How about that? 42 to 41 is the score. Central of South Bend leads by one point over Gerstmeyer. Central just moving that ball. And it's knocked out of bounds. Whose ball will it be? South Bend ball. It's South Bend ball. 42 to 41. And it goes in on this side a long pass. 28 seconds. 27. The time is going shorter. 25 seconds. Everybody's on their feet here at Butler Fieldhouse. 21 seconds. 20. 19. 42 to 41 is the score. Central of South Bend by one point. 15 seconds. Now 14. 13. And the ball is intercepted. And intercepted again by Central of South Bend. And traveling is called with seven seconds to go in the ball game. Five, five seconds. Five, four. Three. Two. three two one. The 
Well, I've been very fortunate. I would say blessed because from my basketball background, from public school 17 and high school Christmas Addicts, and I was fortunate enough to win a scholarship, and I'm sure by being named Mr. Basketball in the state of Indiana, uh, enhanced my total career all the way up through the Harlem Globetrotters. Tremendous amount of pressure. I know the years that I worked was at Butler Fieldhouse. It's when it was held at Butler Fieldhouse, and to get to the playing floor, you went up a long ramp to get there, and I've seen many officials almost turn pale with the pressure that they were under and have trouble getting up that ramp. Then we had gotten into the uh, Christmas season and went down to a tournament in Frankfurt and just played lousy. Uh, probably the worst basketball I'd seen our team play. Very much upset. We sat down and had a few, uh, had a few words about the season and uh, came back after the Christmas holidays in January and started winning and won all the rest of the games and, uh, and went into the, uh, into the uh, tournament with a uh, pretty fair record. Myland. Myland did some things like holding the ball and not shooting that hadn't been seen before, and it turned out that it was good for them. I think that's what makes uh, Indiana basketball what it is, because that small school has the opportunity uh, to uh, beat or bump or play the giant and in this case it was Muncie Central. It's kind of uh, one of those things that happened once in a lifetime, I guess, where we had uh, a group that had played together basically for seven, six, seven years. Uh, they were a group that was fairly closely knit in, uh, in the community. My next door neighbor, everybody was neighbor in Pierceville where I'm from, there's only 45 people there, but my next door neighbor, Glenn Butts, and I uh, uh, hooked up a light outside, and we had a goal outside my, uh, my house, and Madison and Jasper were playing in the state tournament, and he would be Jasper, and I would be Madison, and then we'd change back and forth, and we listened to the state tournament, and, and uh, we uh, kind of played along as we were listening to it. And that's really the first time that I uh, can recall of getting absolutely interested in the state tournament. Uh, the great story about Milan was when Bobby Plump held the ball for three and a half minutes, Marvin Wood said he had him hold the ball because he was trying to think of something to do. The previous year, we had gone to the Final Four and we had a number of players returning. So uh, we slipped up on people in 1953. Everyone knew that we were around beginning the 1954 season. Four minutes left in the ball game. The score, Monday, 28, Milan, 26. And Bobby Plump holds the ball. And I believe we're going to have, we'll probably have a timeout here in a minute. We're down to three minutes and 40 seconds. Three minutes and 39 seconds. We're getting another boy ready to come into the ball game. And we'll see what's going to be. Wendelman's coming in in a moment. A timeout. Timeout. Marlon will take it out now, mid-court. Three minutes and 26 seconds. Muncie leads 28 to 26. And Plump's going to hold that ball now. And uh, he holds it out there, looking over to Marvin Wood. As uh, Milan now starts to go into a weave. They're starting to put the ball in play. Threw it to Plump. Plump behind the circle. Feeds out to Kraft. Kraft fakes. Back out to Plump behind the circle. Three minutes and one second. We're in the last three minutes of the ball game now. Any foul goes to two shots. As it goes to Trud, back out to Plump, who shoots from behind the circle. And misses. Puts the rebound going to Barnes and Munsey. Over it goes to Avalano. And now Munsey is on the offense. As uh, Milan goes into the defensive pattern here. Over it goes, and back out to Avalano, but out of bounds and called out to Milan. Threw it back to Kraft. Kraft behind the circle. Over to Plump. Plump holding, faking, back out to Kraft. Kraft holds the ball. Over to White. Then back to Kraft, who fakes, jumps, and behind the circle, scores. Good side, 28 to 28. Angelana has it on the side. There's a shot from the corner by Flowers. It's no good. Hines picks it up. No good. Drop is no good. Rebound goes to Miles. They brought out there nicely now by Kraft. Scores side. 28 to 28. A minute and 50 seconds left in the ball game. Kraft has the ball. Holding it for Miles. Giving to Bobby Trump. He is fouled by Barnes. A minute and 42 seconds left. 
front shooting two for the Marlin Indians, and the score side, 28 to 28. Good, it's 29 to 28. As Bobby Plump gets ready for the next one. In the air, good. 30 to 28, a two-point lead for Milan. Ball brought down court. Broken up by Milan. Milan breaks it up. As Plump starts to bring the ball down. Over the 10-second line. Plump gives it over. A minute and 29 seconds. Milan leads by two points. As it goes over to Bobby Plump. Plump with Milan dribbling around out in the middle. Trying to get through. Bobby Plump keeps dribbling around as he brings the ball out. Down it goes to White. A minute and 13 seconds. Plump has the ball for Milan. Gives it to Ray Kraft. Kraft goes down in, under, shoots, and goes over to the field and out. A minute left in the ball game. 30 to 28. Has the ball going to Muncie. Muncie has the ball over on the side behind. Hines holds the ball in the corner. And it's broken up, but received by Barnes. Start off, Barnes, shoots and scores. Four ties. 30 to 30 with 45 seconds left in the ball game. Not only was my heart in my throat, but I was didn't want the coach to call timeout because I certainly didn't want to return to the bench and uh, although Mr. Wood never mentioned it he did not mention it he was more concerned that that was something that had happened that he can't change and so his thinking was to hey how can we win the game I think the decision that Ray made was a good decision it just happened that the ball didn't go in and uh, we got the we got the ball back and we got another opportunity. The only thing that was registering that I can recall was that there was my man in front of me that was guarding me and I knew that I had to beat him either to drive all the way or stop and shoot the jump shot. He's dribbling around 10 seconds, 9 seconds. Bobby Plump dribbling 6 seconds. Plump going down, jump, shoots from the circle. Go! We did it. We did it. I firmly believe, I firmly believe that by Milan beating me, that's the first time I've used the words in 25 years, that it kept Indiana High School basketball from becoming classified. I really feel that it had the Bearcats won, and I still think we should have, that uh, they would have classified basketball like they've classified football. And I hope that they never change the format of the state tournament in Indiana. Any time you get competition, it makes you a better basketball player. We played, everybody played together in the summertime around different parks and whatnot. So, you know, it was not, it was not like that you didn't know how a guy played. It's just a matter of execution fundamentals. And we had very good fundamentals at that. Uh, Ray, Ray Crow was a, was a great teacher. Didn't talk a lot, but he got the message across. I first heard of Oscar when he was in eighth grade, and he was playing basketball at that time on junior high team that uh, won a city championship that year. In 1955, we played against, a, it was the first time in the history of Indiana that two black teams played for a championship, Christmas Addicts and uh, Gary Roosevelt, which Dick Barnett was on that team, he played many, many years for, in the pro ranks. But we were the first team to go undefeated in 1956. Probably there wasn't maybe that much difference between Oscar as a high school player, I'm sure he got better, but uh, that big line between him as a high school player, college player, pro player. And I played against Oscar in the pro game, and he goes down in history now as, as maybe the greatest guard uh, that ever lived. The big O, Oscar Robertson. He's the only player I ever saw in the finals that played all three positions, center, forward, and guard, and played him like a star. Oscar Robertson could could do anything. Oscar, I believe Oscar in high school back in those days could have scored 60 points a game if he'd have wanted to. The greatest team I ever saw was the 1956 Annex team. Oscar's senior year. They went unbeaten. They were the first team ever to go unbeaten. And during the course of the season in the tournament, they beat seven out of the top ten teams in the state. I don't think that's ever happened before and it very likely will never happen again. It's like a ballet. It's like a dance that you do. You know, you know, you do things without even thinking about them. Robert. There's one of his favorite spots. Robertson down fast, and a foul is going to be called on Williams. 
That's three in a row now for Oscar. Four in a row. Attic hits seven out of 18 for a percentage of 388. Attic has one less shot, but a better percentage. Robertson is scoring. Merriweather on the rebound, turns it off to Robertson. It goes Robertson around. In there. Now Robertson's going to set it up. Could be seven more points to go to hit the 100 circle. Barnett working. He fires. Good. And it's now 95 to 73. A 22 point edge. 50 seconds to go. Robertson. He'll fire from the corner. Could be it is. <laughs> Yes, that, uh, that was a different situation uh, entirely. Uh, the, the, the club itself was more talented, uh, I would say, uh, um, not any more dedicated, but certainly more talented, and a team that won undefeated and won the state tournament, which was the second time in, in the history of the association that that had been done. There was pretty much of a relaxed feeling because I felt uh, there that the team was capable of winning and and they did win and I think this uh, type of thing was instilled within uh, them which was contrary to the 53 team which was one of those things that you went in and it was dog the dog you didn't know whether you were going to win the ball game or where you where you didn't this ball club you felt assured that you were going to win you do have a great sense of elation and I think our kids at that time took it with a great deal of poise because uh, it was, I think, maybe 10 minutes uh, after the game or, or longer before they even uh, got around to cutting down the nets that they uh, were very poised about the whole thing. And I had a number of uh, newspaper writers comment that uh, the team was, uh, was very much under control in the dressing room and on the floor. Probably one of the greatest memories I have was working a ball game between Kokomo and Newcastle with Jimmy Rail playing with Kokomo and Ray Pavey playing with Newcastle. Pavey scored 51 points, Rail scored 49 points and was perhaps the easiest ball game that I ever refereed in my life because we'd go to one end and Pavey would make one, we'd go at the other end and Rail would make one. Ray and I uh we're in a close battle for the North Central Conference scoring lead, which uh, naturally put the winning the game ahead of, of scoring. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I wanted to personally win the scoring title, and uh, I think I was eight points ahead of Ray going into, the, into this final game. And uh, it went back and forth. It was crazy. Ray got 51 points, and I got 49. So I beat him by six, which was <laughs> I still kid him about that. Jim really played very, very well in the first half. Uh, I didn't play so well really the first quarter. I missed about five layups, uh, which, as some would say, if, if you could hit layups, you could really score a lot of points. Uh, and, and then had a very good second quarter, and then uh, we ended up uh, shooting the ball pretty well in the second half, and it being 51 to 49. But as uh, most people in Newcastle would uh, tell you, Newcastle won the basketball game too. But the thing a lot of people didn't know about Ray Pavey was what a, a fine ball handler he was and had court. Uh, sense. He would bring the ball down. He could do a lot of uh, 
besides being a great scorer in high school, he uh, was a, a ball handler and did some other things which uh, made him important to his team. And I think that was uh, one thing about Ray that I, I always admired. And uh, I ended up being his roommate in college, and uh, we had some good times uh, all through college, really. But he had the unfortunate accident, which uh, left him uh, uh, crippled. So, uh, but he, he was a great ball player and a fine person. On top of that, it was an uh, experience and a uh, great thing to, to know Ray. It was probably the greatest moment of my life. And, uh, you know, uh, any coach that coaches in Indiana, that's uh, the top of the hill. If you can win a state championship, uh, uh, you've made it. I shed a few tears that night. I was very disappointed. I think uh, a lot of people were disappointed. Uh, we, we went through that whole season. The closest anyone had come to us was 18 points. Uh, the regulars played uh, less than three quarters the entire season. We were beating teams that bad. Uh, I think, again, it was just overconfidence, and, and uh, East Chicago played an excellent game. And it's Kokomo 22, Manuel 21. Manuel now by one point. Off on the far side, it goes to Cobb. To Dick Van Arsdale. He'll try a one-hander. Good! Dick Van Arsdale scoring for the Manuel Redskins. And it's Manuel 24 now. Kokomo 21 with three minutes. Ten seconds remaining in the first half. Up on the far side to Ronnie Hughes. A soft one-hand shot. Good! And it goes to Tom Van Arsdale. To Cobb. Back to the free throw lane. He stops. Back to Cummings. And to Dick Van Arsdale. Good! 62 to 59. 37 seconds remaining in the ball game. Manuel leading by three points. Then it goes to Ronnie Hughes. To Cox. Off to Pryor. To Scott. His shot. Shark. Ligon has it. And Ligon has a chance to cut that to a one-point deficit. The first shot. Good. The score at the Butler scoreboard. Manuel 62. Kokomo 60. 25 seconds remaining. Ligon now senses. The pressure on him. He's taking plenty of time. Here's the free throw. Up. No good. Underneath. They're all tied up. It's Scott of Kokomo jumping against Dick Van Arsdale of Manuel. The tip is taken by Manuel, but oh, he's tied up by Pryor of Kokomo. So Pryor. Correction now. Let's see who they're going to have to jump it. Going to be Cummings this time against Cox, the tip is taken by Kokomo, off to Ligon, 20 seconds remain, Manuel ahead only by two points, a shot by Scott, up, good! Scott hits, and it's 62, 62, 10 seconds to go, off it goes to Cobb, to Dick Van Arsdale, it's all tied, 62, 62, three seconds, a shot by Dick Van Arsdale, no good, picked up underneath by Scott, and a foul has been called. Here's the free throw by Scott. Up. No good. He misses. 19 seconds remain in the overtime period. Kokomo on the attack now. 17, 16 seconds. The score tied. 66, 66. Off it goes to Cox. To Pryor. Holds the ball high above his head. And it goes to Ronnie Hughes. Hughes drives toward the basket. Four seconds. A shot by Glover. No good. Whistle underneath. The foul was against Cabo Manuel. Here's the shot by Hughes. Up. It's good. He'll get another. And on the one and one situation. 67-66. Kokomo by one point. Second free throw. Up. Good. By Hughes. It's Kokomo. Long, long shot by Van Arsdale. No good. There's the end of the ball game. Kokomo 68. Manuel 66. I inherited a lot of nice young men from Herman Keller and I'm sure Herman would have won the state with those same men just as I did. Here's Lockyer's free throw, second it was good too, he hit both of them. 84 to 79, 14 seconds to go, Bobby Miles has it, 10 seconds to go, he'll try a jump shot, it's no good, it's not there, it goes out of bounds, awarded to East Chicago. Underneath the rivers, he lays it up and in. 84 to 81, that's the final score, Evansville, Bossy, 84, East Chicago, Washington, 81. I think right from the very beginning, we felt that we had a very good opportunity in 1963. 
the young men that uh, played for me that particular year as we entered practice in October, uh, I think had a real sense of, of uh, expectation on their part. Uh, it was something that I think they grew up with in the community, the tradition that was there that they kind of expected uh, on their own to, to win the state championship or come very close. McCollum to Warren with 18 seconds. He'll try one. He hits. Time's been called. They get the ball down now, finally. And the next clear out. Billy Ray will feed in bonds. 63 to 59. Muncie Central Edge. Off to Billy Ray. He has a little bit of trouble. Whistle and a foul. Called on 45, Jim McCollum. Call him out for South Bend. Gazori can. Ten seconds remain. Billy Ray, free throw line. Let's see what happens. Up, he pumps it in. 64 to 59. We're only ten seconds away from another state champion. Muncie Central trying for an unprecedented fifth state title. Billy Ray, second free throw up. It's also good. 65, 59. Gazorik inbounds to Warren. Eight seconds, seven as the crowd takes it off. Long shot by Warren. It's not there. Finally picked up by Crenton with two shots, seconds. His shot is good. The basket count. That's the end of the ball game. And Muncie wins it. Muncie has won a fifth state title. We came close so many times, and actually we were, the, the team that I was on was groomed all, almost through junior high. Uh, Mary Crawley uh, saw something there, and... Uh, I remember him coming down and watching our practices and things as eighth graders and freshmen. In fact, as a freshman, he took several of us to the state tournament. And uh, we decided then, hey, that's where we'd like to be. This one's for all the marbles. The Vikings, coached by Bill Strait, have a record of 27 wins against a lone defeat, while Marion Crawley's Broncos have the identical record of 27 and 1. All right, Brady, the out of bounds man, passes into Jack Walkie. Walkie now goes to the right side. It's 45 43. His team is trailing by two. He's in the right corner now. Bounces off to Brady. This guy will shoot long if he gets the chance. we got to stick with him like glue. He still dribbles. Back across court to Walkie. Over on the right side is Tillabar. High over his head. That's Brady to Walkie. Walkie on the right side. He can't get around his man. He's being guarded by Underhill. There goes the long one. It's good. There's 32 seconds. How long can Lafayette hold the ball? They still have it in backcourt. This is Brady with the ball with 24 seconds remaining. Gives to Stillabauer. Stillabauer is guarded closely. The throw out to uh, Walkie. Walkie throws underneath. Alone. Pushing up and hitting is Morrison. Morrison hits it at 58 to 55. Jeff leads with 10 seconds remaining in the ball game. There's eight seconds. This is Sennep in the right corner. Sennep fumbles the ball. Whistle. And a foul underneath. And there's a foul underneath with five seconds remaining in the ball game. All right, here we go for the free toss. 58 to 55, five seconds remaining. The free one is off the mark, no good. There's four seconds, two seconds, one second. That's it. Lafayette wins it, 58 to 55. The Broncos are the champions. I remember walking out and saying, I, I can't believe that I'm going to go over and sit down. Well, I didn't sit down too much, I guess. But go over and sit down and coach this team in the finals uh, of a state tournament. And I remember telling our team at, uh, before the game that we had already accomplished uh, much more, that I think, than anyone ever thought we would. We played the, uh, the morning game, and uh, uh, we were a pressing team. We were a, a running, uh, explosive-type team. We liked to press. We liked to get the ball running to the other end. And uh, uh, we pressed, I think, quite a bit in that, that final, um, uh, final game in the morning. And then we had to come back that night. And to tell you the truth, I think everyone was pretty tired. Rebound to Taylor, Winkler. Keller. Turn around, back to Winkler. Winkler from 25 feet, good. Not it again. Stolen by Washington. Keller to Buck. Bob in the offensive court to Gladson. Back to Bob. Northside needs the ball. 23 seconds. Taylor has the ball. A whistle. Foul called on Mike Bedry. Taylor shots good. A three-point lead for Washington. Taylor can make it for 20 seconds left. Good. 
A four-point lead for Northside. They need two quick baskets. Pass intercepted by Mark Lassen. And the Washington Continentals have won the 1965 Indiana High School Basketball Championship. Bill Keller, uh, play, uh, well, they won the state tournament in 65, and uh, he's the only guy that I've ever seen. We played UCLA in the dedication of the Mackey Arena at Purdue. That was my sophomore year and his uh, junior year. And he's the only guy that I've ever seen that could break UCLA's press on the dribble. <laughs> it's amazing how great a ball handler he was. And also, he was a great shooter. Rick was probably the greatest offensive basketball player that, that I have ever played with. Uh, and that includes, uh, you know, not only a high school, but also professional basketball. Rick was an outstanding uh, offensive player. Rick Mount, I remember his father, of course, played with uh, Lebanon and uh, played in the state championship games. And it was a Mount heritage to be in, in the state championship series. And Rick was every bit of good a shooter of as, as I've ever seen. Like in the summertime uh, when I was in high school, um, I, I was a lifeguard and I was on an hour and, and off an hour and, and that off hour I went over and shot like 200 jump shots and and uh, then I was on an hour and then I'd come back and shoot two more, 200 more jump shots. So I'd shoot about 400 jump shots in the afternoon and then in the evening we'd play like three or four hours of, uh, of uh, five on five and uh, and I, I've, I probably worked five or six hours a day on, on shooting and playing. I can't give you anything but love, baby. That's the only thing I've plenty of, baby. Dream a while, scheme a while. You're sure to find happiness. And then I get of the things you've always planned for gee i'd like to see you looking swell baby diamond bracelets woolworth never sell baby <laughs> I really enjoyed shooting and uh, getting out there and just seeing that old net swish. We don't believe in defeat. It's a throwback to Norman Vincent Peale's uh, book on positive thinking, and I've tried to instill that in young men for the last 15 years that I coached. Shot no good. Rebound to Simmons. So does Curry missing that charity toss. Simmons, Cadwell. Back to Simmons, good. There you have it. 63 to 52. The new 1966 IHSAA state basketball champions, the Michigan City Red Devils, coached by Doug Adams. And there's pandemonium on the floor, as you can see. The first time they've ever come to the Final Four, and the state championship goes to Michigan City. The Tech Titans, of course, downhearted. They've been to the final game four times have yet they have yet to win the state championship that we were probably one of the youngest teams to win the state champion it was my 11th year we were a new school in Evansville and I uh, uh, at that time I hadn't won anything uh, in the tournaments except maybe a city championship or a conference and when we did win it we went all the way we won regional we went uh, right on up the ladder uh, semi-state and the uh, final and that was the only claim to fame I have because we never in my coaching career We never won another tournament Lafayette comes on the attack once again trailing by six with a minute ten left to go That's Van Kieran getting in under back over his head good 60 to 56 with a minute one left to go press by Lafayette Ford into the offensive court to Preston Smith It's a game of tag now. I've got the ball you must chase me. That's Holland Ford, a foul called on Eric Jacobson. Ford shot in a one-on-one -on -one situation, no good. Rebound to Hillebrand. He puts it up, no good. Scamble for it. Jessup still fighting. Maintains control for Evansville North. 40 seconds showing on the clock. It goes out of bounds, apparently, and it'll be Lafayette's ball. 
39 seconds. Lafayette trails by four. They're on the attack. That's Strader. Jacobson to Strader. They need four points. The foul is called on Jessup. 27 seconds left in the ball game. Greater shot is no good. They maintain possession. Jacobson puts it in. 60 to 58 with 21 seconds left. A full court press by Lafayette. Evansville is ahead by two. There's Preston Smith across the line. He gets it to Jessup. 10 seconds showing on the clock. They take it out back court. Five seconds. A foul on 34. John Van Curen of Lafayette. This shot is no good. Lafayette has the ball. Three seconds on the clock. And the Hagoran sounds ending the ball game. It's Evansville North, the 1967 state champ. 60 to 58 over the Lafayette champ Broncos. I did score 70 points in a high school game. First half, you know, things weren't dropping in. I had 24 at halftime, but in the second half, I scored 46 points. And, you know, really, at, uh, in the fourth quarter, my teammates were looking for me entirely, and I was taking, of course, the majority of the shots. Brings it this side to Leonard Taylor. Taylor, a one-hander, gets it. The foul was on Greg Allen of Shortridge. The shot by Gary is up and no good. Pulled down by McPherson, who gets the rebound and drops it through. One interesting note in tonight's ball game: this is the first time in IHSAA history that two brothers have played in the final game for the championship for different teams. That's Greg Allen. Leonard Taylor playing for Shortridge tonight is the younger brother of former Washington star Ralph Taylor, who played for that championship team in 1965. He can give him the biggest lead of the ball game with this charity toss. McPherson does it. Harry Roosevelt is the state champion of the state of Indiana for 1968. I've uh, been on two uh, world championship teams with the Pacers. And, uh, of course, I won, uh, went to the championship finals in the NBA with Philadelphia. And people always ask me what's been my greatest thrill and I always refer back to the 1969 state championship team because um, that was the first time that, you know, I felt like I had really accomplished something in, in my life. And, and I think uh, all, the, all the guys on that team felt the same way. When you sit and talk with the Bill Green, you say, how can this guy ever get anything out of an individual? But he does. Bill Green was a, was a type of guy that uh, went out of his way to make you feel like you were special. Uh, never had been taken to dinner before. Uh, he would say, let's go to dinner. Uh, or after a ball game, he would take you over to his house and have his, have his wife fix a lovely dinner for you. Again, the zone press by the Raiders. McGinnis, good. Arnold to Downing, good. McGinnis, way outside, good. Beatty puts it up from the corner. Good. Goods puts it up. Good. Six baskets for Henry Good. Also has four free throws. Stolen by Beatty. He's got it. 13 seconds left. A pressure free throw for Abner Nibs. He's got it. 79-74. Goods trying to let that clock run. He's got a gun quickly. He does. He's got it. 79, 76, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It's all over. It's all over. The final score, Washington 79, Gary Tolleston 76. 1970, you know, in order to win the Indiana High School Basketball Championship, you really have to have outstanding individuals, outstanding in individuals talent-wise as far as basketball is concerned and as far as individuals are concerned. They have to have a special ingredient that we... I think we refer to as character. East Chicago Roosevelt was an extremely talented team. They, they, their front line averaged somewhere around 6'8 or 6'9. And, and uh, not only did they have size, but they had an extremely quick backcourt. 14 point lead, biggest lead Roosevelt's had. Shepard's shot is no good. Artis to Gary. Good. 
74-58. Roosevelt. 27 seconds left. It's their ball game. Ball stolen by Cavanaugh Gary. Shot no good. Goaltending's going to be called. Goaltending called on Odom. Shepard from out back. Good. 13 baskets for Bill Shepard. Eight seconds left. 76-60. Ball to Shepard. Shoots again. Good. 76-62. It's all over. Roosevelt wins it by 14 points. 76 to 62. Leading scorer in the ball game, Dave Shepard of Carmel with 40 points, 14 baskets and 12 free throws. But the two big 6-7 guns for Roosevelt, the difference for the Rough Riders, as Jim Bradley got 24 and John Davis got 21. The first championship ever for East Chicago Roosevelt. 11-10. Tries to throw it in. He's got it back. Throws it off. 6-5. Snodgrass puts it up. It's in! 56 all, a great bucket by Snodgrass, his 10th of the game, ties it. Kent Benson, a 6-9 sophomore with two shots, two seconds to go, first cut. 60-59, what pressure on this young sophomore. If he can make this one, it'll be tied. We're in the second overtime, it's up, it's good! They all two seconds, one second, long shot Underwood, no good, just missed. We'll have a third overtime. Two shots coming to John Babcock, his first free throws of the game, 36 seconds left. First one is no good. We mentioned just a little while ago, he hit a bucket at the start of each of the overtime periods to put Elkhart in front. Second one is good. Three point lead for the Blazers. 63-60, 33 seconds. Newcastle's got to move it in there. Popplewell shoots. No good. Macon's got it. 20 seconds left. 18, 17, 16. Elkhart taking their time. They lead by three. 13, 12. Underwood, underneath the Babcock. Puts it up and in. 65, 60, 3, 2, 1, long shot, Martin, no good, it's all over, the final score, 65 for Elkhart, 60 for Newcastle, we have three overtime, and the Elkhart Blue Blazers move into tonight's championship game. We had what they call a five-man ball club, where all five ball players scored in double figures throughout the year, all five ball players uh, averaged over 500 percentage in shooting, and uh, all five of these ball players that started ended up in college. Turgovich, 15 footer, he's got it. Off to Lefebvre, Lefebvre underneath the Macon, puts it up and in. Turgovich shoots it up and in. Stoddard starts to drive, can't get in, feeds Bailey. Back to Stoddard, left handed hook is good. Underwood's got it for Elkhart. Feeds Macon. Underneath to Babcock, it's in. Stoddard looks for Turgovich, gets it to him, turns, puts it up, it's good. Babcock from the side, no good. Tipped up and brought off there by Bridgman. Bridgman holds, eight seconds, seven, six, five. Long pass, Turgovich, knocked away, one second, puts it up, it is good. The basket counts, and the ball game is over. The final score, 70 for East Chicago, Washington. 60 for Elkhart. The dream was to get that gold ring that uh, you get when you win the state championship. And one of the players made this comment, well, at least we've got the silver ring. Phil Cox again made the comment. He says, we didn't come here to get the silver ring. We're going to win the gold ring. Coach always had us over to the house for chili suppers. And, you know, we'd play euchre. Or we'd play t uh, table tennis. And it's just more like a family, and I, I think that contributed to the team. 30 seconds gone by, stolen by Miller. Left-hander is up and in. Harvey way out back. No good. Rebounded by Clark and in. It's all over. The ball game is all over. The final score, 80 for Connersville, 63 for Gary West, and the Connersville Spartans have won their first state championship. 
as a coach, I always felt I should put the best players on the floor. Whether I liked the individual did not make any difference. Whether he worked hard to me was what was important. Whether he worked with the other people on the team was also important. Just about set to go now. New Albany in white. John Adams in red. New Albany with the ball. Norman puts it up and scores. Webb, 15-footer, good. Mukes from outside, good. Webb hits again. Norman puts up the left-hander and makes it. It's up. No good. Pulled out of there by Norman for New Albany. Gives to Slaughter. Slaughter shot. Good. And Norman makes two free throws. 84-77. That ices it. Both coaches have emptied their benches now and brought in the subs. Just seven seconds remaining, 84-77. Martin with a long one. It's good by Ray Martin. And the ball game is over. The final score, New Albany 84 and South Bend Adams 79. And New Albany coming to the state finals for six times has finally won a state championship. I was privileged to have Larry on my all-star team uh, in 1974. Uh, at that time, uh, Larry was a 6'7", uh, young, immature, uh, gangling kid from the southern part of Indiana uh, that had talent. And he himself, I don't think, knew exactly how talented he was or how good he was going to be. But he, uh, he was a hard-working kid. I would have to say that uh, up until uh, maybe six or eight years ago that Oscar was probably the, the best basketball player that ever came out of Indiana. Uh, there happens to be a boy playing for the Boston Celtics at this time that uh, has really uh, changed my thinking and the thinking of a lot of people in the state. Uh, uh, Larry Bird is a tremendous basketball player. He was uh, in uh, college. Uh, as a high school player, Larry was good, but he was not uh, tremendous, I'll say. Not like Oscar was. Oscar uh, was a dominating force uh, when he was in high school. But Larry, since high school, uh, has uh, really uh, developed into what, well, I think most people would say they're probably the best basketball player in the pro leagues today. We really appreciate uh, guys like Muff and Drinks, who's 6'8". You have a front line 6'6", six, six, and another kid 6'4", and then put a 6'6 six, six guard out there. Well, you got a pretty good team, plus the fact that the Madden, who Tom Madden, was our shortest ball player, and he was a leader. Walter Jordan. It's no good. Muff rebounds. It's good. Three-point lead again for Northrop. 57, 54, 47 seconds. Wall shoots, no good. Gets his own rebound, puts it up and in. Nine baskets for Walls, 25 points. One-point lead for Northrop. 35 seconds to go, 57, 56. Eight with it for Jeffersonville, 13 seconds. Walls, turnaround jumper, no good. Taken off by Baker underneath. Jordan's got it. Four seconds, three, two, one, hit, and a foul has been called, I believe. Madden goes to the line. He will have a one and one. He's hit three out of four up there. Two seconds to go. Northrop leads by two. About all he's got to do is make this first one. He does. The ball game is all over. Fort Wayne Northrop has won its first. Indiana High School Basketball Championship, 59 to 56 over Jeffersonville. Cole Scott, 20-footer, got it. Butcher, way out back, good. Pearson at the line with a one and one. These are big ones for Marion. It's good. He'll get another, 51-42, Marion by nine. Pearson will try and give him a 10-point lead again. And he gets the job done when the ball game is over. The Marion Giants have won their second championship in IHSAA history, 58-46 to over Ligoti. It's a very emotional thing, basketball at Marion, Indiana. It's very emotional when we lose, it's very emotional when we win. Uh, 
we graduated four kids off that starters off that team and kept David Colescott. And in 76, he led us back to the state tournament with four no-namers and Colescott. Two shots coming to Dave Colescott. First one is up and good, right through there. That's the first points of the evening for Marion's leading scorer. Second one, no good, tipped up and in by Neal. Zone still being used by the Giants. From this side, Schaus, good. It'll be Neal jumping with uh, Miley as we start this second quarter. Ball up, tipped in back, Cole Scott's got it. Basket, rebounded up and brought out of there by Freshwater. Dennis Gowen slows him down, now he's on the run. Dave Stolzot from the side, good. Four-point lead for Rushville. Goddard open, short. Miley rebounds, gets it. Rebounded out by Goddard. Three on nothing, Rick Goins is gonna score. Joe Neal from the side, good. Rick Goins, good. Rick Goins from this side, good. Joe Neal open, got it. Jeff Bragg up and in. Dave Colescott, got it. He's the only kid in Indiana high school basketball that has won two state championships, had won the Tressler Award, and was elected Mr. Basketball. We had heard our junior year that there was a possibility that they may start a state tournament series for the girls, and so we were all excited, but we're afraid that it would be maybe a year or two years too late. So when we heard that there was definitely going to be a tournament, that was always our goal, but we were familiar with teams around our areas and knew that you know we were better than most of those teams and yet we had very little knowledge of teams maybe in the Indianapolis area or the southern area or extreme northern area so you know we thought we were pretty good but we didn't know how good the rest of the state was going to be uh, we were used to beating our opponents by an average of 20 or 30 points and we were a very much of a, a run and gun team we decided that, hey, you know, it's not going to be as easy as we think it's going to be. We're going to have to be into each game. And so we um, really set forth right then that each game we would take one at a time and we would never really look to what it was going to be like at that final moment until that final moment came. And it did go right down to the wire in that final game and, you know, with about uh, 30 seconds left, we knew we had it won, and, and right then was an exciting moment. I love sports from the time I was about 11 or 12, and at that time I thought Carmel would never win a state championship, but that was still my goal, to see them win a the state championship. I couldn't do it as a player, so my next best choice is as a coach. Morris puts it up. Good. 56 seconds to go. One-point lead for Carmel. Pressure defense for Washington. Mark Herman with the ball. Burrow, Wiley, 45 seconds to go. Ogle, 40 seconds to go. Herman at the line. Underneath the Hensel, blocked beautifully by Curtis, out of bounds. Clock is running, 29, 28, 27 seconds. East Chicago, Washington, down one. They'll probably look for Morris. 20 seconds, 19 seconds, 18 seconds. 16 seconds, Bridgman, Bridgman, to Morris, up, it is no good, whistle, foul underneath, Hensel, that's five on Hensel, he's hit his last four in a row, make it five in a row, the score is tied, 51 to 51, Drake Morris with 26 points, make it 27, 52, 51, timeout, Carmel. Carmel with the ball, 11 seconds to go. Pass intercepted by Morris, jump ball call between Morris and Herman. Morris jumping with Mark Herman. <laughs> 11 seconds to go, 52, 51. Morris tip, intercepted by Burrow, nine seconds, eight. Long pass, up and in by Ogle. Up and in by Ogle, four seconds left. And a timeout is called. 53-52, Carmel leads. Four seconds to go. East Chicago, Washington with the ball. Clock is running. Three, two, one. Morris, it's no good. Carmel is the state champ.
53-52 over East Chicago, Washington. At the time, it didn't seem that we were starting something. You know, I feel very fortunate to have become involved at a point where they had the state tournament. When I was little, I would always watch the boys' state finals in my hometown of Dubois, Indiana, a little town of 500, and I thought, one of these days, maybe I could do something like that. And that is what crossed my mind. The whole uh, playoff series was, we've got the team to do it. This is something I've always dreamed about. I, we don't want to blow it. And it all just came together. I think that it depends a lot on the caliber of kids you have how success-oriented the kids are, how much they are willing to work, how much they are willing to sacrifice to achieve a goal. And in the case of our two undefeated state championships, they were very willing to do these things in order to succeed. 78, uh, we were just coming uh, back in basketball at Muncie Central. We'd been down uh, before I came there in the year prior to the 78 state championship I think we won 13 and lost 10. And uh, I thought we had a, a, a real good team, uh, but I never was sure uh, just how far we could advance because uh, year in and year out, we have a lot of trouble getting out of our sectional. Usually when we get out of our sectional, we go uh, very far in state. 52-50, Muncie Central, Jack Moore. You may be getting tired of hearing his name, but he is the kind of a guy who seems to always be in the middle of whatever's going on. Bridges. Two minutes and 41 seconds of playing time. Puzzle had it taken away by Jack Moore. The lead pass up the shoot grab. Bigs his man out and gets the hoop. And Cameron gets two of them back. Oh, watch this. Moore penetrates, will bring it back out. Gets inside, got the bucket. Kevin Thompson, a sophomore at 6'7". Got a bounce. Darrell Holt South is six out of six in the fourth period of the line. They have three field goals this period. Thompson has two of them. Cam Cameron has the other. Cam Cameron has it. Terra Holt South with a chance to tie. Ozil, a 10 footer and an air ball. Picked up and back up and good. That is Tony Watson. Watson, 14 point of the game and it's tied at 16. Seven seconds, six and a foul on Watson. Here is Jackie Moore. Wasn't any doubt that was going in, was it? He needs this one. Six seconds to go. Five, four, a 30-footer. It's good! Wilson from about 30 feet away and we've got overtime. Avila on the other side. He draws some attention. Here is Moore. Doing a brilliant job of playing keep away. Here is Moore. Down to 15 seconds. They cannot commit the ball. Terra Haute side. Jordan Neff is yelling, follow, 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 and there it is. It's all on Jack Moore's shoulders. This is Richard Wilson, a 30-footer again. He got it again. One second remains. Muncy Central leads 65-64. They throw it in. Here's the shot from the midcourt stripe. They hit the backboard, and that's it. The buzzer finally goes up, and the game is over. Muncy Central has won it. Team to go. Warsaw about to unload with their second big celebration in three years. Fly to Folk running it down the left side. Who's into the lane? Blocked by Mary Wolf and it goes out of bounds. Shot by Kappas. No good. Rebound Hermish. And she scores. 24th point. She missed the free throw, but Klein gets the rebound. And she scores. That might be the back breaker right there. Shonda has 23, and Folk has 23. Koger fires out of the corner and misses. Long rebound. Folk comes up with it, and is fouled. 
John DeCline with a one and one and the first one is good. 28 for Klein and 28 for Folk. 56 between them. They're both seniors. And they will both have played on two state championship ball clubs. Klein hits a pair. She is seven of eight tonight. 75-58 Warsaw with 23 seconds to go. Long shot. Good. Folk brings it down. Five seconds. Fires to the baseline. Rebound. Knock loose. It's all over. And Warsaw, the 1978 girls basketball champions of Indiana. They have won their second title in the first three years of this tournament with a hard-fought 75-60 win over a game Jackson Bell ball club here tonight. Roosevelt will be wearing the white uniforms tonight, and Madison Heights of Anderson will be in black as we get set for the fourth championship game of the IHSAA girls basketball tournament. Roosevelt has been here before. They were the winners two years ago in 1977, the second year of the tournament. This is the first time ever for Madison Heights to be in the final game. Pollard bumped into her own player, but hits anyway. Latanya Pollard hits the first shot. Pollard out of the left corner. Long range shot, and it goes in. Latanya with four. And the ball is stolen by Pollard on a bad pass down court. Boy, she puts up another long range jumper, and she hits an 18-footer. Jan Bush steps in there and gets that tip and finally gets the roll on one. Pollard, turn around for 15. They boxed off Hexamer underneath. There's a steal by May May Upshaw. She's going to take it all away. Big possession here. Anderson has to get the ball now to get back in this game. And they do. That is Sean Teague, T-E-A-G-U-E. -E. To Kurtz and back to Teague. Here is Campbell for his first of the night. Campbell gets his first two points of the ball game. A near steal, loose ball, picked up and it's thrown away and maybe a foul. Ray McCollum. There will be no foul shots. The bonus is not in effect yet. Into Kurtz. While Kurtz with 10. 61 to 58, 18 seconds to go. Defensive play and a foul. Here is the youngster, the 5'9 senior. Leads the club when it comes to situations where they've got to have the bucket or they need to protect the ball. This is the guy who does it. He's made nine consecutive free throws. All in this period. <laughs> 62 to 58. Won't fall, follow-up shot won't go either. We're down to nine seconds. Bunchy Central on the verge of picking up the state championship. Here is uh, Troy Bridges. And Troy just turned out the lights. Down at the other end of the floor, the other four Bearcats are waving at their fans and they've begun the celebration. It is all but over, five seconds. Here is Sean Teague. He gets the bucket, but it's too little, too late, and the game is over. And the Bearcats of Muncie Central High School have won the 1979 Indiana State High School Basketball Championship. The score, the Muncie Central Bearcats 64, the Anderson Indians 60. Really, the 79 team um, won the state championship easier uh, than the 78 team. They're a control type ball club, but they'll try to work it to Maria Stack as often as possible. Keel, the Stack out of the right corner. Yes! She hits that overhead 18-foot set shot. Hageman. Hagemeyer, rather. Cross-court pass deflected, stolen by Hiddle. They're heading out of Matheny. Columbus gets back. Amy takes it in the lane. Blocked from behind over the top by Hodel. Ball loose on the floor. Hiddle gets it back. Baseline are gone! Kind of sparked the Cardinals who were behind early. Matheny scores from out front. And it goes to Stack. Double team in the corner. Stolen by Matheny on the outlet pass. Here she comes. Keel is back defensively. Matheny on the drive. And they score. She's fouled on the play by Janice Keel. Her second. Matheny over the pick by Callahan. Let's it go. And she hit the 17 footer. Cardinals still have the three point lead with the ball now with five minutes to go. And Matheny, 22 foot pusher. Oh, she hits nothing but the bottom of the net. Columbus East forced up a quick shot and missed it. Matheny, long pass down court to Krieger. Stolen away by Maria Stack at Columbus. Here they come the other way. Three on three. Stack pulls up and shoots. Ball oh, won't go. Matheny tips the ball away and comes out of there with it. Racehorse basketball. 
Lapini slows it up now. And Stack takes it away! There goes Maria Stack down, Kurt Lapini trying to catch her. She fouls it, Stack scores, the basket will count. Inside the Stack, double team. There it is, 1,500 points for Maria Stack, 24 in the game. At the free throw, one on one, in and out and back in. Nine in a row now for Maria Stack. She's got 27 points. Badly missed, Stack with a rebound. Her 19, here she comes. Columbus East can take the lead. She lost the ball, the dribble, picks it up, scores! I don't believe this. 31 for Maria Stack, and Columbus East leads for the first time. Ballinger missed the drive. Rebound, Misty Hiddle, she scores! Will the basket count? It does! Top court back on top. Six seconds to go. Unbelievable finish here in the fifth girls basketball tournament. Here comes Lafini at Southport. She's working for the shot. Nobody there. Oh, no. It's out. It's out. Rieger. Unbelievable. Rieger. Oh. the game. Oh. We got overtime. <laughs> this is unbelievable. We have 41 points for Maria Stack. Is that what you had, Joe? That's right. 19 in the fourth quarter. Lowry got the tip. Southport now has a chance to take the lead. Matheny fires. Good! This uh, is ebbing and flowing. Malander's free throw. Oh, she hit a big one. She is a 55 percenter. That's her third point, her first free throw attempted today. 62 to 58, Southport leading by four. This would be a very big free throw if it goes. She got it. Columbus East. And Court, rich line shoot, she got it. Free throw is good by Datha Harrison, who just checked into the lineup. Her first point today. And what a thrill it's got to be for this five foot five inch senior to score in overtime in a winning championship game. 66 61, 14 seconds to go. Harrison again. The Southport Cardinals are the 1980 girls basketball champions of the state of Indiana. New Albany Bulldogs bring it in, getting full court pressure now by the Rockets of Brotherful High. Brotherful ranked number seven by the Associated Press from the four by UPI. New Albany, number two in both those polls. Richie Johnson. Stacy Turan, the lead pass to oh, Jeff Robinson. What a Great play. play. New Albany, rolling through the season 20 and 0 regular season play, won the New Albany sectional, the Seymour Regional, the Evansville Semi State. Outside is Bennett. He has started some games this year. Here's Tracy. Atkinson on the rebound. Now the bucket. The New Albany Bulldogs will suffer their first defeat of the year. The what an outstanding season they have. 73, 64, shot is up. It is good. It will count. The celebrating begins in Indianapolis. They brought the state championship back to town. We were playing against Anderson, and the Anderson fans had taunted us all afternoon long between games uh, about Watson Alice we take a lot of ribbing over a nickname you know so that night when we sat down for pre-game meal you know I said these people keep wanting to know what an Alice is you know I said tonight an Alice can be anything it wants to be and it's gonna be the team that kicks those Indians rear ends. Ben Sand still leading 40 to 38 though with six minutes and 45 seconds to play the Alice's have suddenly had their scoring shut off in the second half until suddenly 10 feet bangs one hole. High posting is Whitty to give and go to Cook. Nice move inside. Andre Morgan gets the big one. 51 to 46. One minute, 20 seconds to play. Taken away. Defensive play down along that baseline by Tim Beak. Out it comes to Doug Cook. Cook, good ball handler. Three on one advantage on the break. Yeah. And he got the field goal. Doug Cook gets a big one. He has 25 points. And they begin to celebrate in the Vincennes cheering section. Henrik Lewis swings inside and got the fielder. Andre Morgan to David Moore. The layup is good. Moore has his ninth point. We're down to one second and it's all over. The basketball game is history. We'll crown our fourth state girls basketball school champion tonight. We've had only three different winners the first five years. Warsaw won in years one and three. East Chicago Roosevelt in two and four. And last year, the Southport Cardinals were the champions. So we'll have a brand new title holder tonight. I'm sure this will, we'll see this more often. That 
different teams. We're getting better all over the state. With it, Michelle Brand for the right side. Good. Butler for the left baseline. Good. Works with that front to Kilgore. Left wing to Shields, looking for the big gal. Fires. Shields takes the baseline shot and scores. Butler, top of the circle, and it looks like Rushville switched to a man-to-man. -man. Shot, good, Shelly Brand. The other three Lady Lions at the top of the circle. They break out, the lot goes into Stires, up for a 12-footer off the glass, and it's going to fall in. Here's a two-on-one break. Butler underneath, open, Shelly Brand. You know, the team with a player like Scott Skiles on it, that he is a take-charge type player and a doer on the floor, and... Uh, I think a big key then is for the rest of the players to accept their role, and that's where we were real fortunate with the team that we had and that uh, Scott was just a great player, and everybody around the state, I think, knew that. Uh, I don't think they knew just how great he was in the sense of how he could always pull something extra out. Jerry Roosevelt looking for a second state championship. They got it to Skiles, 20-footer. It's good! Scott Skiles hits it at the buzzer, and we go to overtime. 62-60, Roosevelt with a two-point lead. Two and a half minutes, 2.35 to play, to be more precise. In overtime, session number one. Samuel Sun, number 20, playing at a guard spot. Left side of Jamie Johnson. Oh, great defensive play by Winston Garland. Garland on a great defensive effort, brings it across the tie. Samuelson cannot get the steal. They swing it right side to Darrell Scott. Now they start to spread the floor out a little bit. Garland, Winston Garland made the steal and got the hoop. And it's a four-point lead for Roosevelt in overtime. A minute 51 seconds to play. 64 to 60. Gary Roosevelt out in front. Skiles inside. Great move down the lane. Give the hook to number 50, Jamie Johnson. And for Jamie, his first two points of the entire game. Whoa, my goodness. The Plymouth player crashed across that first table and hit his head. That's Skiles put his head on the second table. Deep in the left corner is Skiles. They can't get it to him. Now they do. Great pass. Sensational pass. 15 seconds to go. Plymouth up by one. The game is tied at 64. Here is Garland again. Won't go. Rebound by Plymouth. Knocked out of bounds. And off the leg of Scott Skiles. And Roosevelt's got it again. Six seconds remain. If Skiles gets that rebound, Joe, there'll have been a celebration starting in Plymouth, perhaps. <laughs> A thin, thin margin between victory and defeat here. One point lead for Plymouth, 65, 64. They get it in bounds and a whistle and a foul on Jamie Johnson, Ronaldo Thomas, number 13. Already headed for the University of San Francisco when school is out. Thomas now has 17 points and a timeout has been called. With three seconds remaining in overtime, 65 tie. And this is Ronaldo Thomas at the front row line for the Roosevelt Panthers trying to give him the lead. He didn't get it. It's kept around. Two seconds, one second, double overtime. Double overtime. He's got his second win now. Let's see what he does for these two. I don't know where the entire ball club, Joe, got their second win somewhere along the way. They started out red hot tonight and appear to, as the game wound down, they began to wind down. And somewhere in that third period, after they were down by seven, something happened to this ball club, and they have just taken on a totally new outlook. Plymouth now is up by four again. 71 to 67. They average 76 points a game, so this score is nothing new to them. One minute, 44 seconds to play. 71, 67. Plymouth on in front of Gary Roosevelt. The basket's going to count, and the foul is called against Plymouth. Plymouth wound up ranked fourth in the state in both of the polls. Three-point play. Daryl Scott. He has all five of Roosevelt's points in overtime number two. 71 to 70 with a minute 25 to go. Styles inside. He got it again. 
Skiles has scored six points in overtime. Six of the eight from Plymouth. 115 to play. Two more at the other end from Anthony Stewart. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Wonderful. Under this kind of pressure, these kids have are just shooting lights out at Market Square Arena. To be quite honest, both of the benches have been very relaxed tonight. Drew, he got it. It didn't look real pretty, but it rolled inside. Well, let's see here. Scott Skiles, 6'1 senior, top scorer in the state of Indiana, averaging 28.8, 30 points this afternoon. I run out of how many he's got tonight. Skiles hits an all-important one. Three seconds, two, one, it's over! Plymouth has won the state championship. When you're playing in front of 17,000 people for the state championship, it's not that hard to keep playing. 2.24 to play, here's Beerman. Jody getting her first two points in the second half, now with 16 in the night. 20 seconds to play, third period, 39-34. That lead is the largest that Heritage has enjoyed in this game. Beerman trying to get two more. There's some smiles on those faces with the white shirts on, too. That is beautiful. Jody Beerman continues to score. She has 22. She's so excited she can hardly stand at the free throw line. She's a junior. Wow. Get the winning coach right quick. Let's go, huh? 52 to 45 basketball game with 10 seconds to play. It's all but over. State championship will take a trip up I-69. It is all over. And the final score is 52 to 45. Heritage has won the state basketball championship in girls basketball. Blackman had gotten 50 points against us earlier in the year at Marion when they, when they beat us. And I, tongue in cheek, said, well, if Blackman gets 50 points a game, we're probably going to get beat. Well, Blackman got 51 or 52 points, and, and Troy got 42, and we ended up winning the game in a double overtime and a classic basketball game, as Marion and Anderson usually have. Well, even before the season started, the first day football was over, and we had all the players there together. That was what we told them. Our goal was to win the state championship, and uh, that was our whole emphasis of the whole season was we could get the job done this year. We'd been in a semi-state the year before, um, been there three years out of the four years, and we knew that this was the year we could get it done. We had an experienced team, a great leadership from the Heineman twins. Troy Lewis continues to string him out. He's been invincible at that free throw line tonight. He has it 10 out of 10. And he's 32 points. And he has broken the state record, finals record for the final two games of the state tournament. He's wiping it out right now, as a matter of fact. Gets the roll. Does Jim Cruz, and he has 10. And it's a 61-60 Cottersville lead. The Spartans with 2.50 to go, are out in front by one. Missed shot by Troy Lewis, gets it again, and missed it again. And the rebound, nobody's got it. A wild scramble is on, and Anderson comes out of there with it. Well, we're going to go right down to the wire again for the third time today. Lewis missing, rebound, out of bounds. Now he's got it right side. Off to the brother, and off they go to the other side. Now to David Jackson. Now they've got it to Troy. <laughs> so everybody in the place knew what was going to happen, and they still made it work. The entire place, the full house, every, both teams. Now Anderson's got a one-point lead again at 62 to 61, and timeout will be called by Connersville. Rebound comes out on a long rebound to Wayne Crabtree. Rebounded by Connersville again, and put back up, and it's gone! From the team with the ball, the Anderson Indians are down by one, and they are looking for Troy Lewis. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go keep it away from him. He's got it right now. He makes the move, gets the shot, and missed it. And the rebound comes off the Connersville, and the game is over! The Connersville Spartans have just won the state championship! Sharon Versip is a very talented young lady. She's a coach's dream. And I would say that she has a a high skill level in the game of basketball, but most of all, she has the attitude and the desire to be something rather than just common. She wants to be exceptional. Back to Versa. Versa shooting over Behrman and hitting. Every dad in Indiana wants their kid to be a, a super basketball player, and it's something that they're, some are pushed into, some are guided into, and, and some are in it because they really want to be in it. At the other guard, number 12. 
Now Newcastle will run its record to 23 and 5. I have Alfred done now for 24 consecutive free throws. Exciting game of basketball. You never know what's going to happen next. Rebounded by Hamill again. 54-40, it's a 54-50. Eight seconds to go. Here is Cowan missing. Rebounded by Bedford North Lawrence and a foul. Called on Nancy and that should be five on her. Now this young lady played a win in the fourth period. That is ten points for Nancy Cowan as she fouls out of the ball game. And Pete Pritchett, head coach of Bedford North Lawrence, stands up and gives her a little round of applause also. Three seconds. That's it. Call over. In order to coach any sport, whether it be girls basketball or boys basketball, you have to have a person in the position that's totally dedicated to the young people you're coaching. And I think you find men that are just as dedicated to uh, the girls program as uh, women and vice versa. I think women could, could very easily go in and coach boys if they're totally dedicated to that particular sport. A one point lead, 51 to 50 for Crown Point with one minute and 50 seconds to play here in this overtime session. Here is Blake inside. Blake. Stephanie Blake with 20 points. Average 11-4 at 12 in the victory earlier today. Cowan, yes. Well, the action certainly hasn't let up in the overtime. <laughs> in fact, it's gotten stronger as the game has gone on, which is amazing. 15 points for Nancy Cowan. Super drive that time by Stacey. Is that Rathman? No, it's 23. That is uh, Shuck. Sandy. Sandy getting her first two points of the game, as a matter of fact. It's 54-53, Warren Central with one minute exactly to play in this overtime session. Crown Point fans are on their feet, as are the Warren Central fans behind us. Gilbotskoff again. Unbelievable. She has 17. Team that scores last wins this ball game the way it's going right now. It is short. Warren Central's got it with six. It's five. She had plenty of time to get it up court. Took the long shot. The game is over. And Crown Point has come back from being runner-up last year to win the state championship. Final score, 55-54 in overtime. There are an awful lot of, of teams that have outstanding players that put together excellent regular seasons. Uh, but by the, by the time our state tournament comes around, I think you have to have a group that, that somehow just doesn't really want to die. Uh, you know, each year a, a team dies when, when you lose uh, a game in the tournament and you're, you're no longer a team. Well, if you can get that togetherness to the, to the point where they're just not willing to, to say die, I think maybe that's what puts you over the top. He is three out of three from the line. His only three points of this game, and they've all come here in the fourth period. comes off of the near side to Randy Hobson. Here we go, folks. Hang on. 30 seconds to play for the state title. One-point lead by Warsaw. Ben sends basketball. Swan tries to grab a look at the scoreboard here at Market Square Arena. Not a Tolbert. Down to 19 seconds to go. We are inside 15 seconds. Tolbert's got it. They're looking in the middle. Now we're down to 10. Tolbert one-on-one. -on -one. Baseline shot is up and it is no good. The shot is missed by Hendrickson and a foul of the rebound is against Ben Sim. All right. Here is Steve Holler. He is two out of three on the light. Ten points. Now with three seconds to go. Here it is. If Steve can nail this baby, then Warsaw is going to hang a championship banner in that gymnasium of theirs. He's at it. This ball game is history. Oh. It's all over. The Tigers of Warsaw High School in a sensationally played hard-fought battle right to the wire defeat the Vincennes Alices by a score of 59 to 56.
You know, we got no publicity, uh, we got no praise, uh, yet our girls are ranked the entire year, but because we weren't ranked one and because uh, we weren't undefeated, uh, not too many people even in our part of the state knew us. And uh, we graduated three girls and we only had two returning uh, young ladies back. Uh, and basically what these young ladies did was, uh, from being around the girls in previous years, they learned how to win and they absolutely refused to lose. I don't think we've had this one side of the game of the state finals in the past several years. Well, you get one opportunity and that's all you're going to get against Crown Point apparently at this stage of the game. Two minutes gone, fourth quarter, and a 20-point lead at 42 to 22 for Crown Point. Lady Bulldogs are 24 and 4. I spent uh, 13 years and in, in, uh, never got a smell and was always the guy sitting in the last row or fighting for a ticket to get into the state finals and, and dreaming, uh, dreaming of the day, you know, that maybe someday that I would get a chance to go down and, uh, on the floor and, and be a part of it. Takes it all the way in. points eight of which have come here in this fourth session 119 to play at the other end Mickey Mallory with his eight point and his first bucket here in the second half 110 to go in this contest they can almost start celebrating in Marion because it's almost there Graf almost made a great rebound he finally does and Todd has 20 points so far there's another lad I'm very impressed with yes I am too you're a good point inside a minute Marion with a lead at 71 63 now a little keep away perhaps. Mickey Mallory being chased by his counterpart wearing 22, Devin Johnson. 42 seconds in this basketball game. And the Marion cheering section right behind us, the two hour left, begins to really come apart at the seams. 30 seconds away from the Marion's Giants fourth state championship. Layup is good and the crowd starts to count it. Bounds to Scottsburg. Well, I mentioned earlier, Northrop has had two or three opportunities, Hilliard, where they could have let things get away, but they managed to pull the loose ends together, and now they're right back there where they were again. Well, they're rushing down the floor with their offense rather than taking some time off the clock. Scottsburg basketball. Taji DeBerg working the left side. They've got it inside. They've got, oh, the missed shot by Gullion, and the follow up is good by Farrell. Leslie Farrell has 24 points, and it's a 52-48 basketball game. Scottsburg has gotten itself back in from being 13 down in the third period. Leslie Farrell, who fouled out just seconds ago for Scottsburg, was 12 of 23 from the floor, 29 points and 15 rebounds. All right at the free throw line now is a young lady who's had herself a pretty interesting day also, Jenny Bull. She will not get the free throw. Twenty-nine and zero. We were called jocks, you know. You expect to be real masculine acting, and that that has really changed. In a town of thirty-eight thousand, to come up with something like this without receiving move-ins or transfers or something, these kids are all homegrown. Edwards, seven-point lead now. It's the biggest of the ball game. Eight rebounds. It's going to count, and the foul is on the Anderson Indians, and now the momentum has really begun to roll. Bingo outside, long range, Eric Hathcock. Now the motion begins, they're down to seven seconds. Jay Edwards, Edwards will take not a very good shot and knock it right in the bottom of the hoop, right at the buzzer. <laughs> Pretty good shot for A whole lot better than I thought it was. Edwards. It was a good defensive play made by Kelly, and he got the two points at the other end. 
They volleyball it around and finally track down in the corner. Anthony Tucker out to Kelly. Kelly with a two on three break takes the shot and scores. All the Marion Giants fans begin to stand as Edwards goes in and slams it home for his 25th point. 70 to 50. At the other end, Hathcock continues his good play. Well, Bill Green there, he's a happy man. There's some real talent on either side of Mel Weiss song there. Anderson was runner-up in 1914, 18, and 21, then again in 74, 81, and 83. So they've been to the final two ten times, and they've won three championships, but tonight is not to be. Two seconds, one, it's all over. It is history, and we have seen history made. Bill Green has become the first coach in the history of Indiana High School basketball to pick up five titles. Four at Marion, one at Indianapolis Washington High School. Marion has just won its second successive state championship, and at the same time in the school's history, they have won five, four of those, by Bill Green. What is a Hoosier? Well, I, I would expect he was a person that, that uh, a citizen of Indiana, uh, the moniker you mean? Some man from Germany who was a hussar, who had been lecturing in Indiana and talking about uh, the brave soldiers, the hussars were very brave. And these Indiana people, men, when they'd get in fights with the Kentuckians coming up here in these Saturday night brawls, they'd start yelling out, we're, we're hussars, we're hussars. I think it, well, the one story was a guy was in a bar and they got in a fight and his ear got cut off and and uh, they somebody came in and said whose ear is that? The uh, Ohio River story where the uh, people going by on the river boats would yell on shore to the people uh, living on shore who's your state? Well, he walks around the 500 mile track dribbling a basketball is a true Hoosier. I do know what it means when you talk about Hoosier hysteria you speak in terms of high school basketball, you speak in terms of camaraderie, you speak in terms of a language that everybody can understand who's been through here and been to a high school basketball tournament. Hoosier to me means basketball and uh, Indiana basketball. Well, my father took me and I took my kids and now I'm taking my grandchildren. Uh, having been in this business for so long, I'm now writing stories about grandchildren of guys that I covered way back when. And they start them out when they're just barely young enough to dribble a ball and so they just develop into basketball players. When you mention Hoosiers, you just think of Indiana basketball. Every kid that you see almost throughout the state will have a hoop on a barn or in a garage like the one I had. The only thing I can say that I know one thing a Hoosier is, a Hoosier is a, is a basketball lover. So wrapped up in the game that they see nothing else, think nothing else, and are completely and totally devoted to the game of basketball. Seven days a week, but on Friday night, and Saturday night, it's the number one thing. Indiana basketball means excitement. It means uh, usually winning and fun. A Hoosier is uh, <laughs> someone that knows the game of basketball and um, has a lot of pride. The most talked about thing in Indiana every day of every year. You talk to somebody who doesn't live in Indiana, who has never had the opportunity to be a part of, uh, of basketball in Indiana, and they just don't realize it. They, they can't comprehend what it, what, what it means. It is a holiday. An underdog has an opportunity to knock off poss possibly the num number one team in the state. It's the greatest. It's been the hub around which my life has been lived. In the state of Indiana, if you accomplish anything, as far as the basketball is concerned, they never forget you. Some kid going home at night from a uh, outdoor court somewhere, raggedy pants on, maybe a shirt half ripped and dribbling a ball, hot, sweaty, dirty, heading home, probably some little house somewhere. Got a you know, a, a dream of being Mr. Basketball. <laughs>